Lord, help me to forgive. Okay. Let me give you a couple opportunities. Your mother-in-law is coming over today. He said, I will be with you. I don't expect you to do it yourself. I need you to stop running around the doctor's office because I'm going to give you a few injections that you're not going to like, but you got to sit still. They don't hurt that long because my love is the anesthesia that keeps the pain from the surgery. Amen. Yes! My Lord in heaven, please be seated. Please be seated. Oh, thank you, Lisa, for that song. Jesus, bless your people today. Mm-hmm. Somebody say, mm-hmm. Yeah, it was horrible. So <laughs> I just want to start off. I just want to start off by saying I titled this message. It's going to make sense as we go. It's called Runaway Bride. And you say, well, what does that mean, runaway bride? Well, I'm going to get to it as we, as we move through the sermon today. But I just want to start off by talking about how we, you and me, we are just fidgety people. We're fidgety people. Because when God tries to probe in areas that we don't want him to probe in, we get fidgety. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, church, you need to shout with me today. I want to hear you because get it in your spirit. So, you know, true story. True story. I can't make this stuff up. When my daughter, Nicole, was really little, she must have been three or four years old. She did not like the doctor's office, and she did not like shots like most people did. So my wife and I, we took her in, and she's sitting on the little paper at the top and of the, you know, the table, and, and the doctor walks in, and she spots the needle, and she panics. And she, see, everything was okay until she reached an area where she was not comfortable. And so what she did was she got off the table. She jumped to a, to a kid that's three years old, table this high is like a mountain. But she jumped off and she started running around the room. Now, I want you to try and imagine this. My wife and I are in there and we love her so much, we need her to get this shot so she can be healed from whatever she was sick from at that time. So Terry's like, I go, you go over there, I'll go over here. Now, the doctor's over here. Terry's on this side, and we're like, we're like this. We're trying to catch a chicken. You see, we're like, we're like this. She's running over here. Terry gets her. She runs back this way. Terry goes, I get her. And finally, we grab her. I'll tell you what, it's easier, it's easier grabbing a wild animal than my kid that day. So Terry grabs her, and she, but this is what she does. In the midst of her terror, she picked her up, and she laid her against her, and she held her and comforted her while her right arm was sticking out, of course. <laughs> And she began to just rock her, and it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be, well, in the midst of the okays, there was a boom, 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 done. Wasn't that bad. But see, mama had to take her when she was uncomfortable, grab her, pull her in, rock her until the doctor was able to accomplish what he called his, what he was uh, trying to accomplish, which was to give her this or administer this shot. See, sometimes you don't want to be, you just don't want to be probed in areas where you're uncomfortable. You don't want God to dig in where you don't want him to dig in. But if he doesn't dig in, the area is going to get infected, and you're going to be so messed up, you're going to wish you weren't. I mean, come, sometimes, sometimes the area is so messed up that you're like, why didn't I do something about this? Well, I tried, but you wouldn't let me. So God sometimes, when you call out, he hears your cry, and he will grab you so you can't get away, and he will pull you in. And that's when you're, you're like the Flintstones. You ever see the Flintstones when the feet move like this, but nothing's happened and then it grabs and the car takes off. That's exactly what you do is you're running and running and running, but you're high up in the air and God knows exactly how to hold you and make you feel comfortable while he's performing surgery on you. But he gives you free will. You have to choose to not be the runaway bride. Somebody say amen to that. If you would, please. All right. I like that. All right. When we run to when it's okay, but we run away when it's hard for us. But God only blesses those that stand, those that stay. That's the ones he blesses. Amen to that. 
I mean, you don't even have a clue of what he's going to do with us today. Runaway bride? What does that mean, runaway bride? Well, what is, why did I choose bride? Well, I, I didn't choose it. The Lord did. In Revelation 19.7, he talks about, the Bible talks about how the bride has prepared herself for the Christ to receive her as he comes. Well, the bride that has prepared herself is the one that stays because you can't prepare yourself. You don't have what it takes to prepare to perfection, so you have to allow God to prepare you. And it's only when you stay, knowing that the shot may hurt, but you go, that's all right, I'm going to stay because it's going to be over. And in the midst of his love, that will be the anesthesia. His love is the anesthesia that numbs the pain. So, But, you know, the whole thing is, is the bride runs because the man is not being the groom. In our life today, the bride runs because the man is not being the groom. And Jesus calls us his bride because there's a reason he calls us his bride. Because a true groom, gentlemen, if you're thinking of getting married out there, and ladies, if you're looking for a man, the true groom is a man who literally makes a vow to take care of that wife for the rest of her life. He doesn't care what she looks like. He doesn't care if she gains 50 pounds after they get married, or he doesn't care if her teeth fall out or her hair falls out. She, he doesn't care. He has made a vow to love her, and love means I will protect you, and I'll provide for you. I'll nourish you. I'll cherish you, and I'll gently restore you when you're down. I'm not going to go against you. This is what a real groom does, and there's not a woman out there that wouldn't want a man that would do that perfectly all the time. But that man doesn't exist. There are those that try, but they do fall short of the glory. But we have a God who sent the perfect groom who says, listen, I need to prepare you so that I can take care of you above and beyond what you could ever think or imagine. You don't even know what it's like to be blessed until you come into my arms and let me bless you. But I'm going to do some probing. I'm going to dig. I'm going to make it hurt a little bit. I'm going to make you do things you don't want to do. I'm going to get rid of friends you shouldn't be having. I don't know if I'm into that. I don't know if I want that, Lord. If Jesus is the perfect Jesus and he's the perfect groom, why are we runaway brides? Because we would rather carry the monkey of sin on our back than let him dig deep and remove it. Not knowing that the blessing is on the other side of the surgery. Amen. Somebody say amen out there. Come on. So God removes every fear and every emotion before he jesus ever came on this earth we started talking about him the bible started talking about jesus in genesis it started talking every every chapter in the bible talks i mean sorry every book in the bible talks about jesus the messiah and and isaiah i've read this i've quoted it but i said it this morning and all of a sudden god said now i want you to start breaking this down I want you to break it down. I want you to bless the people. I want you to really show them who I am. Because the more you know who he is, the more you'll let him dig. Come on. Amen? And you stop running. You bought the dress. You're in church. You got the cake and you got the, you, 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 you got the whole thing going. Why would you walk down the aisle and then run? Whoa, because we keep our eyes on what is right and what is good, but as soon as it gets stuff and our mind starts thinking, we run. We don't have to work at the areas that are easy. We just need to let them tear apart the areas that are not. So Isaiah 41, starting with verse 9, but I'm going I'm to just quote verse 8. He calls, us, he calls us heirs and children of Abraham. So if you know Jesus... You're, a, you're an heir. You're an heir to the kingdom of heaven. You're a child of Abraham. Well, I'm not a Jew. You don't have to be. That's what Jesus came for. He says, listen, all the Jews, come on. All the Gentiles, you're welcome too as long as you know Jesus. We're all the same. There's no judgment. There's no, there's no differential. So it says in verse 9, Jesus, talking about the Lord, God says, I took you 
from the ends of the earth, from the farthest corners, I called you and I said, you are my servant. So I, I, I dug you out of the dirt. I, I, dug you from, I dug you from the muck. I took you from the disaster. I have, I have looked at your life in all the mess. Listen, if you're in the mud, you stepped in it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you're in the mud in life, you're the one that stepped in it. Nobody pushed you in it. I mean, sometimes it happens if you're a little kid and you're out in the middle of the street and, and you're nine years old and you don't like girls and you just push one in. Did I just say that out loud? I never did that. I never did. Or did I? I don't know. But you jumped in the mud. And even in your own silliness, he'll remove you. He says, I, hi, he says, I have got you and grabbed you from the furthest corners of the earth of your muck. He says, I have chosen you and I have not rejected you. What are you talking about? God rejects sin. He rejects Satan. Luke 10, 18, I saw you fall like lightning from heaven. I just rejected you, Satan. So he rejects Satan and Satan's whole biggest sin is rejection, which he pushes on all mankind. So everything that every situation that you have, you can take back to the to the to the emotion or the fear or the or the or the foundation of rejection. And this is what he's trying to say. I have not rejected you. He's talking about Jesus here because when the Messiah comes and you receive him, there's nothing you could ever do that would cause me to reject you. He's saying this in Isaiah 40, 1, that he doesn't reject you. Jesus isn't even born yet, but there's no timeline in heaven. So what is, was, and will be. What is, already was, and will continue to be. Are you getting a hold of that? No timeline in heaven? You got to remove time out of your life? What is, what he's saying right here, already was, and will continue to be. And ain't going to change. Okay, you're going to get this as we keep going. So he says this. So don't fear. I don't know what you're afraid of, but don't fear for I'm with you. Don't be dismayed, which means worry for I'm your God. I will strengthen. <laughs> That's a silly word. The words when somebody strengthens you, they're preparing you. They're preparing you. Like Pat was talking about earlier with, with working out. If you're going to go into a bodybuilding meet or a, a weightlifting competition, God, will, you will have to prepare. You can't just walk up and bench press 400 pounds. You got to work up to it. You got to prepare. But it's not easy. It hurts. And you don't feel like getting up at five in the morning and eating raw eggs like Rocky did and then going to the gym and, and stuff like that. So he says, I will strengthen you. But he says, and I will help you. So in the midst of me teaching you and in the midst of me you know, reforming you, I'm going to help you get through it. These are his promises, people. These are the promises of God. And he says this right here. I love it. He says, all who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Isn't that amazing? I'll make it to when people come against you. I'll make them wish they never opened their mouth. But you can't run away. You got you to stick with it. Keep listening. He said, this, he said, he goes on to say this, and he says, he says, those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. And though you search for your enemies, you won't even be able to find them because I'll get to them first. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. I'll deliver you before it comes. Amen. Keep listening now. That has many meanings to that. If we wanted to break it down, we're not, which we're not going to. He says right here, he says, those who wage war against you, those who cause trouble, those who try to start garbage with your life and, sp and spread gossip, he says, those who wage war against you, they're going to be as nothing at all. You need to stop running just because you don't like what so-and-so said to you. You need to cut that out because you got a God that's trying to bless you, serve you, lift you up, bring you to the place that you can't get to on your own and he can't settle you because you're running around the doctor's office because you don't want to get your shot. Amen? So he goes on to say this. He says, I love the, verse 13. I love it. He says, for I am I am, he says, the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do you what you have to understand is when he says, for I am, that doesn't, nothing's going to change that. 
You can't change it. The devil can't change it. The world can't change it. The government's not going to change it. He says, for I am. And at my appointed time, if you'll just stand and stop running, I will make you the best bride you could ever be. Keep listening. Keep listening. I'm almost done with this scripture here. It goes on to say, this says, do not be afraid, you worm, Jacob. You just little, you nothing. He called him a worm. He called Jacob a worm. You just, you're just, you're nothing. You're just a little worm in the dirt. That's all you are. We were created from what? Dust. And what lives in the dirt? Worms. He's saying you're nothing but a worm without me. Because he says, he goes on to say this. He says, do not be afraid, you little worm. Little Israel, do not fear. He's telling them, he's reminding them how hopeless they feel. And he's telling them, in your, in your minuscule way that you see yourself, stop worrying. Stop worrying. He says, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Now, God is not the Redeemer. Jesus is the Redeemer. God is the judge. Amen? Jesus is the Redeemer. So who's talking here? Wait, wait, Jesus wasn't even born. How could it be him talking? What is, was, and will always be. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Three different names, one person. So who is speaking already was and will be. So what he's trying to say here is I got you covered before the problem ever shows up. I got you as a bride before you bought the dress. I got you as a bride before you were born. Amen. I am the great I am, he says. And what I have said, no man can change. Somebody should be shouting right now. Whoa. So how do we learn this? Jesus has left us the Holy Spirit. He says in in John 14, 16, he said, I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit to teach you. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit so that you can understand what the shots do and what the blessings are about. But here's what the Holy Spirit's name is. This is what a lot of people don't realize and don't understand is the Holy Spirit. It's he's called Holy Spirit. But when you break it down, it's in a broke it down in the amplified version, he's called the comforter. So in your in your pain, he will comfort you. He's called the counselor. So when you're struggling and you're crying out to him, he will listen. He's called the helper. So when you're ready to quit and you say, I can't do it, he says, but I can, I will help you. You see, he's called the intercessor. He is called the advocate. He is called the strengthener. He is called the standby. He is before you were and before your problems existed, he fixed them if you'll just stop running. Amen? Now, he is preparing his bride to bless you in a way that you could never imagine here on this earth or even in eternity. But he is going to dig in areas that you don't want him to dig in. Uh, just, just a real quick little visual for you. Bruce, if you wouldn't mind just kind of hanging out here on the keyboard. Now, Bruce is one of the finest keyboard players I have ever known. But when Bruce was a kid, was a little Bruce, and he had to take piano lessons from this lady because he just knew there was a bunch of white and keys and a bunch of black keys, and he didn't know what they did, and he didn't know they were called notes and, and none of that stuff. But you wanted, all you probably wanted to do is play music because when a person picks up an instrument, they just want to play music, but they don't realize what it takes to play music. You see, so the teacher will teach you scales and arpeggios. Now, don't ask me what arpeggio is. He just told me that word. I don't know what it means. Look it up. It's probably something you put in pizza. So he, he's working on scales and arpeggios, and they are boring. Just give me a, a basic scale, C to C. To C. Okay, that's good. I learned it. Now, teach me a song. But he had to play it. Oh, now, what's an arpeggio? Play that. That's an arpeggio. Who knew? Do you think he just sat at the piano and decided to play that one day? No. His teacher says, now you go home and practice that and come back next week. Wax on. You go home and practice it again, come back next week. 
go, when do I get to learn a song? Just go home and practice that scale and that arpeggio. I did. I got it. Watch. No, 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 no. No, go home and practice it again. Practice it again. Practice it again. A month goes by. Two months go by. Six months go by. When do I get to learn a song? I'm digging in an area you don't want to do right now. I'm causing you to sit still and do something and you don't want to do it. You want to run. So most people say, I don't want to be a piano player anymore because I don't want to do what it takes to be one. So I'm going to run. But it's those that stand that do one of them things, Bruce, you know, all over the place. Take it. That's a bunch of scales and arpeggios all put together in one big pot of song. Amen. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you so much. Come on, man. Give him a God bless you. So those of you that say, I don't want God to fix me, believe me, you got a lot of scales he's going to dig up and a lot of arpeggios you got to practice before you can become his perfect bride. Because he has promised that he is going to take care of you for the rest of eternity. That there's nothing that's going to keep you from his eternal glory. And his blessings on this earth are beyond what you could think or imagine. But you got to let him fix you and dig in the areas because we get really uncomfortable when he starts to dig. Now, we, how come we've done that? Because we have forgotten our first love. Revelation 2, 4, we just forgot our first love. We forgot the beautiful scriptures. We forgot that we have to actually do something if we want to learn how to play the song. So it says in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, listen to how beautiful and simple the scripture is. But yet, remember, your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is your, is your, your, your comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby is the one that's going to help you do what I'm about to say, because this is the only thing that God's going to do to bless you. If you don't do this, he ain't going to bless you, but you can't do it on your own. So he's here to help you. He's just waiting. Do you know, do you know, if I, I mean, you can't, you can't put the Holy Spirit into a picture, so this is just a, uh, an example, a, a metaphor or a, or a parable, but the Holy Spirit spends most of his time doing this. Because that's what you do. You, 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 you know, I got a job, to, I'll do it for you. But you can't. Yes, I can. Okay, go ahead. And then he's got to play catch up with you. It's hard to play catch up. It's hard to knock the barnacles off, put something on so they don't grow. So it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says, if, say if. Yes. That's a huge word in the Bible. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. <laughs> And pray. Oh, I got to do something? Yes. And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Some of you want to get up and go now. I just soon have the monkey on my back. You will till the monkey bites you and kills you. Because we only know earth. And the pain that the monkey gives to you is beyond what you even want to imagine. Turn from their wicked ways. He says, then I will hear from heaven. I will hear you from heaven, he says, and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. But you can't run. You can't be the runaway bride. You you gotta stand still. Because however you have got to stop running, however you however you are living, whatever you're doing, you've got to stop running every time God starts to dig in the area that you feel uncomfortable, you are tying your shoes. Take them off. Take your shoes off and stick around for a while. Amen? Amen. Okay, so now, let me just move into this here. When, when God starts to dig in these areas that's too painful um, or rebellious, we, we don't let them in. We run. That's when we run. So what are some of those areas? Those areas are, here, listen, here we go. Here we go. He comes at you with his shovel out because he wants to dig in the areas of where you are bitter. And he wants to dig in the areas of unforgiveness and anger and blame and porn and greed and pride. He wants to dig in these areas. He wants to fix these areas so you can be made whole and become the perfect bride. Do you know I say this quite a few, but I can't say it enough because maybe somebody will hear it one of these times. But gentlemen and ladies, one of the most dangerous 
sins that you can open the door to is a sexual sin, and that is pornography. When you open the door to pornography, you, you enter into a fantasy world and you leave a God world. And when you leave God, you enter into the fantasy world and you will never be able to find a partner that can do what those movies are doing because women were never like that. That's from a man's point of view. Somebody better shout and say amen. And you open the door for generations of perverseness and generations of sin and generations of challenges upon your life. And the enemy is going gonna, is gonna to try and get this, get this to you and pull you into the, to the realm of pornography. But God is trying to say, listen, I will send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is going to comfort you while he's digging. And he's going to counsel you and help you and intercede for you. And, and he's going to be your advocate. He's going to be your strengthener. And he's going to stand by while you're crying, screaming, and kicking. But you got to kill that perverse spirit off. How do you do it? Sometimes you got to get rid of the people you're hanging with because they're the ones helping you do it. Sometimes you got to get rid of the TV shows you're watching because they're going, oh, look at that. I think I know that actress. I wonder what, and you start looking her up and now she's in a bikini and next thing you know, she's not wearing anything. Next thing you know, you're at another website. Before you know it, you can't, you can't leave the computer. I got to talk to people all the time that this happens to. It's not like this. The enemy knows how to get you in. He's going to dig and dig. And when God says, don't do it, don't do it. Amen. Amen? Just say no. Just, just walk away from it. But here's the thing I want you to talk about. Bitterness. Bitterness and unforgiveness. Oh, my gosh. Bitterness and unforgiveness, it's like that destroys you. Unless you forgive, God can't forgive you, it says. So let me tell you how God prunes you. Let me tell you how he prepares his bride. If you have a problem with unforgiveness, he's going to help you and help you practice forgiveness. And he's going to bring people your way that are just the bitterness of your life. And you're going to go, well, I don't, I'm never going around that person again. No, no, he brought them. He brought that person your way. The person who has created bitterness in your life, he had them call you. You ran into them at Starbucks. You saw them at J.C. JCPenney's. He, God brought that person there because the only way he can cause you to not run is to face your bitterness and face your unforgiveness and quit being bitter and start forgiving. Amen. <laughs> See, sometimes people are like, why don't you go back to telling me how everything's going to be okay? I am, but it's not going to be okay unless you understand this first. You see what I'm saying? You can't eat the turkey unless you go buy it. You don't sit at your table and go, time to eat. We never bought the turkey or cooked it. You ain't eating. All right, you go be in a closet eating crackers. Now, now, here's another thing. Anger. Oh, anger. Woo! Anger. Some of you people are so angry because you're hurting. You know why you're angry? Because you can't get rid of bitterness and unforgiveness. And then you're going to be sick on top of the whole thing. You're sick because you can't get rid of bitterness and unforgiveness. And as the body goes, as the soul goes, the body follows, the Bible says. So if you're going to continue to hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness, you're going to be an angry person and a sick person. Amen. So you got to let go of that anger and God's going to bring you into situations where you can have a, an opportunity to control that anger. But I don't want to control it. I want to be mad right now. Well, you can't be mad right now. Oh, yeah, I better call upon the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's my comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and stand by. Hallelujah. Remember the scripture? Not by might nor power, but by my spirit. How do you think you're going to be the perfect bride? You can't, you can't do one of these things on your own. Right. Me neither. Me neither. Yes. Sometimes you got to take a deep breath, stand back, and call upon the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 These are the, those, those little headphones that I wear. You also me have them too. They're the best things we invented. Because you, you could be listening to somebody and have them in your ear, and it's like, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, this is just in case the phone rings. You got your music blaring. All you hear is this. <laughs> They're screaming at you, yelling you, and you go, yeah, I understand. I, under I understand. Sure, I understand where you're coming from. I can see how you're upset now. Yeah. They start screaming. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. I agree with you. You see what I'm saying? You, you, God's going to give you a, an opportunity to deal with your anger. He's going to, you're greedy. You're a greedy person. It's all about you. It's all about you. Sometimes God puts people at the bottom of the, of the highways, ex, exit ramps. We're, we'll work for food. We'll work for food. You know, I ain't giving them nothing. They're there every week. It's a scam. Well, maybe God gave you an opportunity to get rid of some of your money because you're so darn greedy. Amen. 
I'm just, I'm using money as greed, but greed comes in many different ways. Selfishness, greed, it's all, God gives you an opportunity to forgive. Lord, help me to forgive. Okay. Let me give you a couple opportunities. Your mother-in-law's coming over today. Amen. Pride, pride, that's, my gosh, Proverbs 6, 16, 17, 18, God hates pride. It's one thing, he detests pride, he hates it so much, because pride destroys you. It destroys you. So, I, you know what, when you first came to this church, some of you, if you remember before God told me to let other people do it, because if I do everything, I'm going to be the solo pillar that holds the whole church up, and then all I got to do is buckle, and the whole church falls apart. So, but I used to stand out in front of the parking lot with, in 100-degree weather, and I'd have my little white, little green vest on, and I'd be waving everybody in. Come on in. Come on in. Let's go. Let's go. Because people think, well, you're the pastor. That's not your job. Do you understand the lowest position in the church is the pastor? Amen. Amen. Well, who's the highest position? You are. You are. My job is to bring you in, raise you up, and send you out to do the same thing. But until I ask you to go ahead and wave people in the parking lot, I got to wave first. Or if I'm in the bathroom, some of, what you doing, Pastor Joe? Let me get that. Hey, I'm just mopping up the bathroom because people can't hit the urinal, so I'll mop it up. <laughs> well, let us do it. What, I'm not too good. See, I got no pride. Amen? But did I have pride before? Absolutely, man. I was in Hollywood for 10 years. I was, I don't do that. Mm -mm, that's your job. But no, you can't do that if you're serving the king because pride comes before the fall. So God gives you an opportunity to remove your pride. Are you listening? Are you ready for this? Are you going to be a runaway bride? No. Then you better be ready to face the stuff head on. But he said, I will be with you. I don't expect you to do it yourself. I need you to stop running around the doctor's office because I'm going to give you a few injections that you're not going to like, but you got to sit still. They don't hurt that long because my love is the anesthesia that keeps the pain from the surgery. Amen. How do we do that? Quit, quit saying, I'll just be happy with the monkey on my back. No, you're not. Trust me. Trust me. That's not what you want in life. James chapter 4, verse 7 says this. I love it. I'm wrapping it up now. He says, submit yourself then to God. How are you going to, how are you going to let the Lord make you the perfect bride? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But verse 8 is what I want you to focus on. He says, come near to God and he will come near to you. In other words, the only way God is coming near you is when you move near him. But how can he come near you if you're a runaway bride? Amen? He's going to let you run because what you end up doing is running in a big circle and coming right back to him again. It's just in the midst of your lap, a lot of junk happens. Amen? So quit being that runaway bride and, and resist the devil. He will fear. Come near to God in your struggles. Come near to God when you're angry. Come near to him when you have pornography on your mind or selfishness or pride or bitterness or unforgiveness. Just come to him. Come to the cross because the Holy Spirit's waiting there with everything you need to help you get to the other end. Amen. God is going to prune you. He looks at your brokenness. You are his bride, and you're in a ragged, torn outfit, and he needs you in a gown. Now, gentlemen, in case you're new to the church and it's first time here, God calls his children his bride, man or woman. It's not, a, it's not like we have on earth here, but I'm going to use it as a metaphor. So you're standing there in rags because you're broken, and he takes hold of you, and he says, I'm going to make you the most beautiful bride ever. How, God? How? You don't know my past. You want to make God laugh? Tell him that you think you know something he doesn't know. Can you imagine God being the gentleman? Really? So you stand before him in your rags. You stand before him in your bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, blame, pornography, selfishness, arrogance, pride, mm. and you listen to him because he's going to look you in the eyes and he's going to say, ask me for wisdom and I'll give it to you without finding fault. Yeah. You want to know what your wisdom is? Go right back to the word of God again. Come on. 
and he's going to remind you. He's going to say, my righteous right hand will see no wrong in you because of the blood of Jesus. And I will bring you to the place of no fear. And I will strengthen you. And I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And those who come against you, I will cause them to be ashamed and disgraced. And I will fight your enemies who wage war against you. And I will help you. And I will redeem you. And I will bless you on this earth. And I will bless you on et- in eternity. You are my bride. And I will do this for you because I love you, but I need you to stand and not run away. Amen? Amen? Come on, give him a dormant of praise. Jesus. That's all I got. We don't want you to leave today without giving you an opportunity to follow Jesus. The Bible says the only way to the Father is through the Son. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We invite you to take a moment and ask God to forgive you and to help you follow him on this journey. If you've made this decision today, make sure that you get into a church that teaches the word of God. And remember to read the instruction manual. That's the Bible. If you're in the area, come visit us at any time. Check out times and location at orlandofamilychurch.com or at 407 462 1358. Hope to see you there.